We're going to be creating a memory game from scratch using JavaScript. And this is going to be a dynamic memory game where we can update the grid size. The objective of the memory game is to select a couple squares and try to find a match on those squares. And if you do find a match, then you can continue until you've turned over all of the game squares in order to find a match. This is going to be a dynamic grid. And that means that we can update the dimensions of the grid and it will populate and the game flow will still work the same as it did before. So we can still find the elements. The gameplay ends once all the matches are found. To create a grid dynamically with JavaScript code, also how we can select elements, how we can update properties of elements, how we can add custom values into the elements, and then applying some game logic in order to make the game functionality and the gameplay. So let's get started and create this memory game from scratch with JavaScript. Connected the JavaScript file to the HTML, selected the main page element, and we want to create a grid. So let's construct a grid and create the dimensions for the grid within an object that we can then use in order to determine the grid size. And we want to make the grid doing it four by three so we'll have a total of 12 squares all together for the grid. So there's going to be four columns and three rows for this grid. Let's get the total number of cells for the grid. And that's going to be coming from the grid X and multiply it by the grid Y. So that should return back a value of 12. And that will tell us how many divs we need to add into the main container in order to create the grid. So let's go ahead and we're going to create those elements where we're going to be creating the grid. So the total number of elements and we'll create a function and this will make the game board or the grid and using a for loop. and looping through while the value of i is less than total, and then increment i by one. And we all also want to launch this function. So on the document object, add an event listener. So add the event listener. And the event that we're listening for is DOM content loaded. And when the DOM content is loaded, then we want to make the grid. So that should run through where we're making the grid. So let's create some elements. So I'm going to create a function that can help us generate some elements and attach it to a parent. And the parent div that we're going to be using is the main element. I'm going to clear out the word JavaScript from the code so that we just have the main div. And let's add a class to this. And we'll just call it game class. So we can select the element using its class name instead. So selecting the element with the class of game. And we still need to create the function that's going to be the making of the element function. So this will require a parameter and one will be the type of element. So getting the element type. And the second parameter will be the parent. So we're going to create the element according to the type and then add in the parent. And if we need any other values, we can add those in as well. So we can add in inner HTML. And then as we loop through, we're going to attach the divs, create a div, so create an element. And using the document create element method, this will allow us to dynamically create an element using JavaScript code and update the element. So we're going to add and update the inner HTML of the element. So add the HTML code into it and then return back the newly made element, and we want to parent it to the parent. So if we use append child, that will allow us to return the element back that was just created. So the return back on this function is going to be the created element, and we're making some updates to the element. And we can add in other parameters into the function as needed. So here within the loop, we're going to create the element using the maker. And we can also still select the element because this is going to be still referencing that same element object that was created. So in this function, as we loop through the values of i until we reach total, and we know the value of total currently is going to be 12. So it's going to essentially make 12 elements on the page using the maker function. 
we're passing in the element type, the parent that we want to attach it to, and the inner HTML content that we want to add in. So let's create the HTML content. I'm using the backticks, so for the template literals. And so for now, we'll just add in the value of i plus zero for the HTML. The parent is going to be the main element object. So we're referencing it by the object. So when we send it in as a parameter within the function, it's going to pick it up as the parent argument and then use that parent value in reference to the main object. And then the element type is going to be a string value. So whatever element type we want to create, this is going to allow us to create that element on the page. So there we've got the 12 elements that have just been created. And actually, this should be plus one, so that we end up with all 12 elements being created on the page. So we want to update some of the properties of the parent and create and apply some grid styling to it. Now, you could do it with JavaScript, but that's going to take a lot more lines of code. And we do want to focus more on the coding. So I'm just going to simply update and add in the styling into the HTML within the style tags and display this. And the display property is going to be a grid. Can set a width of it and setting it as a 90 vertical width. And then uh, set the margin to auto. So that will center the main container. And you can also add a border around it so that we can see the contents of the main container of the elements. So they're not going to be set within a grid structure yet. Uh, so we can apply the grid structure to the parent after we've created the elements, where we can append to the parent the grid column property. So once we create the grid, we're selecting the parent element, which is being referenced as the variable name of main, selecting main, and then applying the style properties. So just as you would any other style, we can set the property. And the property that we're setting for this is going to be the grid template columns. So we can use the CSS grid, which will automatically structure our grid structure. And then within the second value of the argument, we need to create the repeat. So setting it to repeat, and then the number of times that we want it to repeat. So setting that as a value, and this is coming from the grid, and whatever number we have for y. And then comma separate that out at 1fr. So save that, and that's going to create the grid structure. And this is also, the nice thing about it is it's going to be a responsive grid structure. For the HTML, we can also create the box. So this can structure the page elements and apply a box-like structure to them. Uh, so do a text align. And we can then add the class to the elements as they're being created. Uh, also for the border, set it to one pick solid. And then whatever we want for the border color. And I'm also going to update the cursor to the grab. So whenever we're on top of the elements, we're going to set them as the grab. And then as they're being created, we can also add in another one for class. So set a class value. And this way we can easily set the classes for the elements as they're being created. So once we select the element using the class list, we can use the add method. And this will allow us to add the class. And this is coming from the CAL as a string value of box. So it allows us to essentially apply the class to the elements. So that gives us this type of structure where we've got the elements on the page. And also for the box, let's set a minimum height for the element. And also you can set a line height and that will center the text vertically. So now that we've got our grid, we want to create the contents for the game. And that's going to be the main array 
and within the array we want to just set them as colors so the objective is going to be to have the different colored squares and then flip them over and match them with other different colored squares so I'm just adding in some named values for the colors that we can then use in order to match together uh, so these are just uh, typical name values so that they're distinct enough that we can tell the difference between the colors and I'm also going to be using them as the backgrounds uh, so these are also going to be applied as the colors of the backgrounds of the cells so that when uh, the user does select it we can save ourselves the trouble of having to load an image and we can just have the color load within the cell contents. So I want to make sure I do have enough and I will need at least six for a grid that's uh, 12 so that we need to double the number of items that we have within the array in order to accomplish this. So if the value of total is going to be larger than the value of twice the length of the array, then we're going to change the value of total to be the value of twice what the length of the array is. So take the value of total and we can apply a ternary operator and get the value of length times two and make sure that it is less than the value of total. And if it isn't, then we'll take the value of array length times two and set it for the value of total. Otherwise, we just keep the value of total as is. So that will be a default in case we end up with a value of eight. And so that way, we're not gonna ever run out of items to place that this time uh, we've got seven items within the array for the game and we're selecting eight by three. So that's 24 divided by two. So that's expecting 12. We don't have 12 items within the array. So we're gonna be limiting to whatever the number we have. So this is a way to make it dynamic and in order to keep the gameplay uh, so that you don't have any errors with the calculations of the content. Because we're trying to make this as dynamic as possible. So once we create the grid, we can add all of the elements and we're not gonna have any blank elements uh, that we're adding. So once we make the grid, I'm going to create another function. And this function is going to be add boxes. And we're going to loop through all of the elements that have a class of box and randomize. So we're going to create a game array. So I'll create that as a game object. And within the game object, we can have a blank array and we'll populate this array with the contents of the array items and then shuffle the array. So let's create the number of elements. And for this, we're going to need to pull out and use six items as uh, total is going to currently be 12. So we can get that value and using the value of total divide it by two. And this is how many squares we're going to need. So for the game, we're going to get the value of total divided by two. Let's also build the new array. So build the new game array. So taking the array items, we'll sort the game items and then randomize the order of the items in the array. So using the, within the argument of the sort method, you can randomize it by returning back, and this is going to be randomizing it in place with a math random and subtracting by 0 0.5. And this will return back either a positive or a negative, and that's going to affect the sort order of the items in the array. And we can have that demonstrated in the console. We can output the array and then take the array and randomize the order of it and every time we do this, it's going to sort the array in place and return back a different randomized order for the items in the array. And we can use this within when we're selecting in order to select out the first six items from the array and then add them into our new array that we're going to create. And then we need to duplicate that array and we can do that by concatenating it together and then randomizing the items within the array. So we'll have two matching pairs of each value from the original array. 
So now that we've sorted the order, we'll create a for loop, let i equals zero, and then loop through while i is less than the game items value. Now we can increment i by one. And now we can just simply go through the array items because they're randomly sorted. So it'll be different every time and we can create and update our game grid. So selecting that value and then within the game, game option, we want to push in the item from the array with its index value that's going to be attached to the loop. So as a result, let's console log out what we have for the game. And we need to run the function once the content, once the grid has been made, then we want to add the boxes to the game. So that's going to create this array with a random order of items. So there's not going to be any duplicates in there. And now next we want to join the array together with itself in order to form the final array. And so let's actually, we're going to create a temporary array. And this is the one that we're going to push the contents into. And then after that's done, the game array will use the concat and concatenate together the contents of the temp array. So using the temp array and joining it to the temp array. So that should create an array with 12 items. And that way we have the matching pairs of the items. And right now they're going to be still within the same order. So we want to take that and we want to randomize the order of that. And we can do that the same way we did this function where we're randomizing the items in the array. So that creates a randomized set of paired values that now we can use in order to populate the contents of the cells in order to continue to create the gameplay for the player. So let's select all of the elements that have a class of box. And we can select them from the main game object. And this is going to be all of the cells that we have that we want to fill. So boxes and using the main game object and then query selector all. We'll select all of the elements with a class of box and then loop through the boxes and we're going to add in all of uh, the game items according to their index value. So this will return back the element and for the element we'll add in two separate items. So we'll have a front and a back. So for the front use the document create element and we can actually use the maker function for this. So add in the content where we're going to be getting the element type can be a div. Uh, the parent for it is going to be the main element. The HTML contents of the front can just be blank. And the class that we'll add into it will just be front and we'll apply some styling to these elements. And then create another one for the back. And for this one, uh, this is where we're going to hold the content. So again, a div element, and this can be back. And the front is going to contain the contents of the game array. So we'll add in that as the string value. And as we're looping through, we can use the index value that we have for the elements and apply that to the index value within the game game. And also for the back, instead of adding in the numbers as we're looping through, I want to add these in afterwards. So we're not going to be adding anything in for the HTML. So we can simply just remove that and just have a blank space for the HTML contents of it. And here is on the back is we, we can add in the numbers for the elements. And that can also come from the index value plus one. So that will add in all of those values and show them randomly on the page. 
So this is what the user is going to see. They're going to see the number and then the hidden value is going to be the one that is going to contain the, the word. Uh, so let's select the front and add update the style to background color and we can also use the game color for this as well. So there's more of a visual for the users. And as you can see, there's two of each one that's being shown within the cells of the game. And also we want to apply a style property of display none. And this is what's going to get toggled when the user clicks the cell. So by default, it's going to be none. So that's going to be hiding all of those elements. They're still present within the game board, but they're not, uh, we're not able to, uh, to see the results of those. So next up, we want to create the game play where we're going to be able to match the content. I'm going to add a second element to the game, and this is going to be a message area where we can provide some communication back to the user. So create the element, and we're going to use the making maker again. And instead of creating the element, we can use the function in order to create it. Uh, the parent for this one is going to be main. The Actually, this one's going to be the document body. It's going to be the parent for it. The element type can be a div. The class on this can be message. So we'll add the message class. And then the HTML can just be press any square, any square to start. So that will provide the some content for the user and some feedback that we can apply to uh, for the user to be able to read. Uh, for the message, now that we've got that element, I'm going to add in the message and we can do a text align for this and update some of the font size. So that provides the user, uh, that provides us an area that we can provide some feedback for the user. Uh, so the next item that we want to do is as we've made the grid, we want to be able to select the elements and we can add in the element selection when we're making the grid. And this is going to be an on click event. So whenever the element gets clicked, we'll run the function and we'll just call it flip or flip box. And within the functions, now let's create the function to manage the flipping of the box. We'll take in the event object, so that way we can log the target as the parent. So we'll create the parent element, and this is going to be coming from the e-target. And console log out the parent element into the console when it gets clicked. So that should make all of the squares clickable. I'm going to reduce the size. I do have it at 200, so just uh, reduce the size so that we can see the console. And now whenever I select the element, if I clear, and if I select it, I can find out all the details about the element. So right now this one just has a class of back, and that's the element target. So let's update this and get the parent node from the element that get clicked. So that way we've moved up to the box, and we can make a selection if uh, we want to flip this or not, so let's uh, do that where we're going to be flipping the element and it, only if the back is being shown. So if the element with the back is being shown with the display properties and I'll add in the display properties of block so that they're all being displayed as block for back. And we can use that value and this should be the back is being displayed as block. So we can use that in a condition where we want to select the element with a class of back and we can use the query selector for that. So select the element and select the element and in order to select the back we can use the parent element and then query selector to select the element as an object with a class of back. And we'll also do that for the front. 
So that will select both of those elements. And for now, we'll just output into the console just to make sure that we do have the element and get the style and the display property for it. So there's our display property, which is block. And there's the element that we've selected. There's the parent element. So now we can use this within a condition to check to see if the display has a value of block. And if it does, then let's toggle the values where we'll flip them and selecting the element and update the style properties to be none for that element. And then the corresponding the element will update that one to be block. So that will essentially flip it over. So now when I click the elements, and this one actually should be the front, should be displayed as block. And this actually should have the word front for a class for front. So now when I select them, it's going to essentially flip over the card. So we want to add this into an array for elements that are flipped. And once we have two items within that array that are flipped, so we're going to add in the elements. And this will also give us a way to check and remove them if they are found to match. So once we make that selection, we've selected the element and we're going to push that into the flip. So select that parent node and flip. And that's going to be contained within the main game object. We push the parent in. And we also want to check the length of the game flip. So if we're selecting a second one, so if the game flip length is greater than or equal to two, then we we'll want to flip them back. And we want to select all of the elements that have been flipped and we're going to flip them back. And this will expect the one parameter and that will be the parent element. So we'll send that in. And from there we can select all of this and do the flip. And otherwise it will do the opposite where it will set it to block and set the front to none. And let's actually be more specific with what we want to do. So what we want to do on this from the parent element, and this can be a Boolean value. And depending on what the Boolean value is, so if we want to hide it, then we're going to send in the true. And otherwise, we're going to send in the false. So let's try that out where we click it. And actually, this should maybe be false, and that should be true. So let's go through and uh, we'll create another main timer that we can set an interval into. And that can also be contained within the game object. And the timer will launch as needed so we can set a timer into it and flip the cards back. So right now that we've got the number of cards flipped, so whenever we're clicking the button that's running the flip box function, and we want to check to see how many cards are flipped. And if the number of cards are flipped right now, if we're updating the flip list push, we want to do a check to see how many items are in there. So let's update the message and text content to the string value of cards flipped. So that way we can track the value. And this will be the length of the items within their array. So we've got one card flipped, we've got two card flips. So at this point, we want to be able to stop the flipping of the cards and pause the game. So we need to add in another variable here, pause of the game. And right now that's going to be false. So we don't want to have anything clickable while the game is on pause. So first we check to see if game pause. And if it's not true, then we can run the code. And if it is true, let's uh, indent all of this so it's easier to read. So if the game is paused, then we're going to run the else and output the message game paused. So let's set a value for the game pause. We'll have a condition. If the length is equal to or greater than two, they're going to run the game pause and set that to true. And this should actually be the greater than or equal to. 
So now the game should be paused and we should be able to check to see if there's a match as well. So we'll create a function called check cards and we'll run that. And within the check cards, this is where we can pause the in check cards. We pause the game and this is going to check the two flipped over cards for the values. And then also we're going to set the timeout in order to unflip them and reset the pause. And we'll also add in a timer that we can uh, set the timeout in order to execute a function to run the particular code. Uh, so that's where we can use the timer object that we've created within the game and using the game timer, set the time out and run the code. It's going to be flip back, can be the function and then the delay that we want to do this. So 500 milliseconds and you can adjust that as needed. So create the function for flip back. And so when this function runs, we should flip the cards back and the cards that are flipped are currently sitting within the game array. So we've got the game flip array. So we can loop through those and using for each, select the element. And here we can do a flip back, passing in the, the parent where we had the toggle flip and the element is gonna be actually the parent and flipping the element back will set that to false and try it out. So right now the game is paused. Looks like uh, something went wrong. So try that again, refresh it. We click the two squares and the game is paused. So we need to actually remove these items from the array as we loop through them. And we can do, once we do a flip back, we can set the array to be zero and that will clear the array contents. And we should also remove out the game pause and set that to false. So that allows us to select two cards. So if we try to select more than two, then we get that paused message. Uh, so we also want to, as we're looping through them, so where we've got the check cards, we want to check to see if the card values are going to be a match. So let's set up a variable called match, be false. And then this is where we can set the timeout. So we might want to remove the elements if there is a match. So let's loop through and console log the element. So they do loop through and we got orange and purple. And we're also including all of the inner text. So as we're setting the game, let's set an, a variable value within the main parent element. So select the element and set up a variable called val. And this is where we can contain the game. And then we can use that to check to see if there's a match. Because we can't just use the text content. As we saw, we're throwing an error there that we're getting the rest of the text content. So this way we can easily check to see if there's a match between them. Uh, so let's set up the value of match the first time we go through and check to see if the value of element val is equal to match. And if it is, we console log match found. And we can take an action on that. And if it's not a match, then we'll set the value of match to be equal to the element value. Let's make uh, the game board smaller so it's easier to pull up a match. And we'll see if we did get the match. So we do get match found. So that's working. And we do, don't run that if the match is not found. So if the match is found, that means that we want to remove the cards from the game. And I'll update the board to be a two by two. So we still get all four cells, but it's going to be a little bit bigger on the screen. And I'll also increase the size back up to 200. So now when we find a match, we don't want to flip them back over. We just want to leave them as is. So let's select that. And instead of running the timer, we'll only run the timer if the match is still, if it's not found, called found, false. And if it is found, then we can toggle that to be true. And that can help us control the other actions. It's not found, then we can run the timer. Otherwise, it should stay. And we also need to, so we've got the flip back. So if it's found, we'll have a condition that we run the game timer else we want to reset and unpause the game and flip the game length back. And once we find all of the cards, 
So we also want to make it once uh, the element has been found, we want to make it so it's not clickable anymore. Uh, so we can set a Boolean value on the element. So going through the game flip, and before we clear out the game flip, let's loop through the elements and update the element value and set the element value for found to be true. And then as we're constructing the elements, we'll set it to be false. So this way, once we found the match, then we can update a score on the match as well. So if we're tra tracking, and then that way we can tell if the values have been completed. So once we click on the parent, we're adding the event listener to the parent. So check to see what the value of the parent node is under the parent found value. And I'll clear out some of the other console logs. So try the game out. And right now it's false when it's found. And now it's true. So we can check against that, that now this is true. So when instead of flipping the box, we want to make sure that the parent is not found for it. So we can set a second condition that's going to check to see if parent found is true, then it, it won't do the flipping of the content. And otherwise we can continue with this where we're flipping the content within the condition. And let's uh, indent that so it's easier to read. And then this part here is, uh, this is if the parent is found. If it's already found, we don't want the user to be able to click it again. I would put a message that it's already found. So that will leave it that you can't click those and you can still continue to click all of the cards. Uh, so now that once we've got everything flipped over, we want to end the game. So where we've got the cards flipped and where we're checking to see that they've been found, we want to update the score. We're taking the game object and add a score value to it, just comma separate it. So that's going to be calculating the number of items. And then also we want to use the original total for the grid as we're making the grid elements. So add in another value of total within the game or object. And that way, when we're making the grid, we can assign a value to it of the game total will be equal to total divided by two. And we can now take the game score and match it against the game total. So every time the card is found, we'll take the score and that's going to be the game score and increment it by one. And then we also want to check to see if game is over. Score is equal to, or we can say equal to or larger than game total. And if it is, and that means that all of the items have now been solved. So restart the game. So now we get the game over and we won't be able to click on any additional items. Let's update the parameters of the game. And you should play through the game a few times just to make sure that it, everything is working on the different sizes. And after you've had a chance to test the game, ensure that it's working, you can also apply some customizations to the game as needed. So go ahead and try it out and create your own version of the memory game using JavaScript. And one other quick fix, uh, I'm going to add in one other class, and this can be the active class. So whenever an element is selected, we're going to make it active. And I'll apply a border for this. So that can be one pick solid. And let's make the border red. So let's add to the element, to the parent element. And I'll add the parent on the outside of the condition. So that way we can check to see if the class list is found or if the class is found. So select from the parent and using the class list, add the class of active to it. So now when we select them, they're going to have that red square around the element in order to indicate that it's active. So we want to select the parent and then remove out the active once we turn them back. So where we've got the flip back and as we loop through the elements, we can remove out the active class. So try that and that removes out the active class from it. So we also want to check to see if the parent class contains a value. So if the class list contains a value, so we'll just uh, create a temporary value and using the parent element and then class list, we can check to see if it contains a class and the class that we're looking for is going to be active. Let's log out the temporary value. And I'll make this smaller once again, as we're still doing some testing on it. it. Has the class list 
that class is still going to be active and we're not going to be able to click it again. So this will prevent us from being able to click twice on the same element. So that's what uh, the error right now that we're getting. If we flip over an element, we can actually flip it over twice. So we want to remove that option where we've got the class of active. And if this is going to be false, then that's when we can add the class of active. So that won't give us the option to click a second card. And that prevents that type of error from occurring where we can't click the same card again. A fully working game. Try it out. Create your own version of the game. Have some fun with it as you learn more about JavaScript and how you can update and set element properties with code.